This is the home of the O'Connors, mother, father, and three teenagers. Here comes young Tim now with a pal of his. Tim is 13, a little than he was last year. He seems vague, but is very busy thinking just the same. As usual, he's hungry. Tim always seems to be eating, probably because he's growing so fast. That shirt fitted him perfectly three months ago. He's at that stage when they suddenly shoot up just about puberty. Mrs. O'Connor doing some hospital work this soon. With her family growing up, she has most afternoons to herself. Her family is interesting during these in-between years when the children are finding themselves and becoming people in their own right. I was for supper. Tim was just making it easier to cut into five pieces. His good humor is infectious, but he simply must learn to respect other people's plans. It's fun to have them grow up and become independent, but after all, you can't just stop being a mother all of a sudden. Joan is 15, very mature, and conscientious about her schoolwork. Sometimes her mother wonders if she really needs all those books she carries. Jo Success with the boys. Joan is cheerful and outgoing, adequately good looking and easily mannered. She's been going steady with a classmate whose name bracelet she wears and this places her in an enviable position among her feminine classmates. Joan doesn't admit to outsiders that she really isn't crazy about Peter, but you have to have dates if you want to be anybody, and she feels that the only way to be sure of having dates is to go steady. But tonight is different. She is going to risk losing her steady by going out with Jim Bronson. He's 18 and a football star. He drives his father's car, and they're going on a double date to the Rosedale to hear a jazz group. Jim plays the trombone, too. He's smooth. She must tell Marge the news. Line's busy. Maybe she'll have time to give a little assistance now. Well, if she can't tell Marge, she'll have to tell Belinda. O'Connor is fond of his family, but not so inclined to worry about them as their mother is. Keen follower of the sports news. Barry, Jones' twin, and a chip off the old block. Schoolwork seems to be the least of his worries. He's a skier of some note. He is well coordinated, sure of himself, and equally sure that his parents are old fashioned. He intends to buy a pair of handmade Austrian ski boots. These don't give him the control he wants. Father can't see anything wrong with these boots. Practically brand new. It's nonsense about the boots making such a difference. Just a racket, a waste of money. Not asking Dad to buy them. Not an Olympic contender, just trying out for the school ski team. Dad just can't get used to seeing Barry as an independent near adult. At this point, Barry is only arguing for the sake of argument. Used to do all right with a pair of $12 boots. 20 years ago has nothing to do with it. Skiing today is totally different. 
15 wants independence even more than he wants the security of knowing that his parents think he is right. Dad doesn't realize that his insistence on not buying the boots will only heighten Barry's determination to buy them. Barry is so much like Bill. Funny they don't understand each other better. Bill should try to realize that even though they are alike, Barry has to be himself. Tim is keen on chemistry just now, not so keen on being with a gang all the time. He has always been interested in science, but now under the influence of a young and enthusiastic teacher, Tim is going all out. Mr. Albright is his ideal just now. His remarks are quoted by Tim with a regularity that is almost annoying. Must go to the next parents' night at the school and tell Mr. Albright how much he has done for Tim. Maybe ask him to suffer. Used to worry Mary a little because Tim and his father hadn't any common interests. A boy at this age needs someone older to admire. After all, why should both their boys be just like Bill? Funny how mothers sometimes seem to understand boys better than fathers do. Mary thought she knew all about baking soda, but Tim has a new angle. The subject of the boots is not forgotten, but is carefully avoided by both parties. Tim's joke has relaxed the tension and everyone is glad. World outside. The teenagers have opinions on almost every subject, and if they haven't an opinion, they're quick to form one. Father and mother help them to be realistic, to consider different points of view, and to develop sound judgment. Joan is keenly aware of social problems and earnestly wishes for better understanding between the peoples of the world and between the different classes in her own city. What a pity that this idealism of 15 can't be retained. One wonders sometimes if they wouldn't do a better job of running things than their elders are doing. Barry's humor isn't always kind, but tonight Joan is riding so high even Barry's teasing doesn't make her mad. Barry's expecting an important call. Who cares whether Gail is wearing a sweater and skirt or a dress? Tim is so agreeable, so vague and dreamy, with his life as yet uncomplicated by social activities. Who's going to help with the dishes? Joan just hasn't time. She has to do her hair and press her dress and have a bath. After all, she has a very important date. Tim did it last night. It's Joan's turn. Who says her date is so important? Everybody has other things to do every night. Wasn't there a definite agreement that the three of them were to take turns? It's Joan's turn, and that's that. The normal teenager is so very occupied with his own busy life that he is self-centered. Almost has to be if he's going to keep up with all the learning he has to do about people and things. The dishes aren't Tim's problem. It's Joan's turn. Okay, but why does father have to pick tonight to be so mean? Mother really wouldn't mind doing it tonight, but better not confuse the situation now by saying so. Bless Tim. You can't count on it, but he does come through admirably sometimes. To keep this family of strong-minded individuals running smoothly, there have to be rules. But a rule is only a good rule if it can be broken when the circumstances demand it. Tim's generous gesture was possible because he has found that doing the dishes really isn't so bad. It's a chance for a busy parent and a busy boy to cooperate on a job and exchange ideas on a basis of equality. Right now, this is important to Tim. Doorbell and phone are not long quiet in a family of teenagers. The 
basement wasn't big enough for a real recreation room, but by careful planning, a space was found for the teenagers to entertain their friends in privacy. At this age, the group and its ideas are so important that they must get together often. Home is more comfortable than some soda bar. Putting the record player in the basement was Mrs. O'Connor's idea. Tim has a table in his own room, but when the kitchen is empty, it makes a good laugh. It isn't that Tim does people, but he is so busy in his relationship with other people that he likes to be alone. He has one intimate friend, though, who shares his interest in chemistry. David is a year and a half older than Tim, but he has been slower in developing than some of his 14-year-old friends. He is not as well coordinated and as good at sports as many, and is not at all interested in girls. Happily, he has found that Tim, although younger, is at about the same stage. Of course, neither of them are conscious of this. Hobbies in the early teens tend to settle into permanent interests. Who knows, David and Tim might become scientists. Tim's parents show an interest, but they don't hover. Tim's own interest keeps him going. What teenagers need is scope and freedom. With them, almost everything is an experiment. This experiment may go the way it was supposed to go, or, by accident, it may turn out quite differently. But whichever way it goes, there is learning in it. It's incredible how many times they can listen to the same record and still enjoy it. Even at 15, they can swing from being very adult to being what might be considered childish. A place where you belong, where you are accepted at your own level, is very important. Only in that way can you find out what your own level really is. They can talk for hours. Sports, cars, people, sports, news, girls, sports. At this stage, their interest in life is quite different from earlier when the facts of conception and childbirth were learned. Petting, girls, sex, these are matters in which their interest is more than passing. Barry's good relationship with his father and the way in which his knowledge of sex has been kept up to the level of his interest in the subject pays off. His attitude is healthy, unworried, and confident. Of course, he's not above an off-color joke, but it's got to be a funny one. This is the big moment. Jim, by now, takes parents in his stride. He is sure of himself. He's 18. He's been taking out girls for years. Joan is not quite so sure of herself. Thank goodness father takes it all calmly. If only mother wouldn't flutter so much. Oh well, Jim doesn't seem to notice it. Mother is a bit concerned tonight. She has heard that she has quite a reputation, and she's afraid Joan is getting out of her depth. Father takes a dim view of this running around in cars. She's just a child, after all. Sure, they're young, but they all go out in cars. It's just different from the generation before. Maybe not so different as that. She did seem to be settling down to go steady with Peter Erdley. She's much too young for that, too. It's ridiculous, going steady at 15. But what can parents do about it? Perhaps they should try to give Joan more guidance. 
it's hard to know how much to interfere. Somehow, Mary trusts Joan's judgment. After all, since she was a little girl, they have tried to help her develop a sense of values. Now she's ready for one more step toward responsibility. Dates with different boys will help her set standards based on her own experience, rather than on the experiences of her parents. Joan's glamorous evening has been fun. Dancing to the name band was exciting. The boys had a couple of beers during the evening. Joan drank ginger ale, but she felt a little self-conscious about it. She wishes she were more sophisticated. Jim is really so hand moved. She wonders what he thinks of her. If she could get him for a steady, would she really want him? At 15, if you're a sophisticated 15, you're beginning to wonder about love. But love tends to be confused with excitement. When you're just a bit older, you realize that love will come later, and that you can have a good time without falling in love. Learning how to get along with the opposite sex comes at different ages, and it Thank goodness, she's home at last. Is mother awake? She had a good time. The band was wonderful. Jim? Okay. Night, Mom. Maybe she'll tell her mother more about the evening, and maybe she won't. But anyway, Mrs. O'Connor is sure now it was right for her to go out with Jim. She had to find out for herself whether this was her kind of date. Saturday morning at the O'Connors finds everybody hurrying to get through a few chores in order to get on with the activities of the day. Barry does the errand he is asked to do, but he doesn't loiter around looking for ways to be helpful. He's off downtown with the gang. He'll be back for lunch. Hasn't tidied his room. Well, he's the one who has to live in the mess. Mother will close the door and leave it. When it gets bad enough, he'll clean it up, with a little urging, of course sometime when he has less important business to attend to. Joan is going out to collect ads for the school magazine. She has seen scarves worn this way in a teenage fashion magazine, and it looks smart. But the gang haven't started to wear them that way yet. She'll wait till they do. If Peter Erdley, Joan Steady, calls, Mother is to be sure to tell him that Joan will be back for lunch. So she's still interested in her less glamorous Steady, the O'Connors don't insist on a lot of chores on Saturdays. This free time is so precious to the teenagers. But jobs like house cleaning and simple repairs can be a joint parent-teenager operation and give a sense of teamwork and accomplishment. Joan and her gang are busy comparing notes about their job for the magazine. In fact, they seem to spend most of their time comparing notes about everything, dates, clothes, School activities, boys, other girls, necking, drinking, parents. Gossip is more than just gossip at this age. It's a way of learning what other people think about what other people do. It's a way of learning what you should do yourself. When you're not sure of yourself, it becomes doubly important to be accepted by the gang, to be like them, one of them. And to be really accepted, you must be able to make the grade with the boys. Joan is one of the lucky ones. Susie would rather have a boyfriend than anything else, not because she is so fond of boys, but because of the standing it would give her in the group. Now that the workshop is fixed up for the kids to have their friends in, it looks like the tools will have to be moved to the living room. Of course, they had intended all along to tidy it up this morning. Bill enjoys his occasional chats with Barry's friends. They really are quite a gang. Nothing like sports to bring out the best in a boy. 
Chatting about the relative importance of equipment, training, and natural ability in sports, Bill is surprised at the thought the boys have given to these matters and how serious they are about their skiing. So Barry decided not to get the new boots. There wouldn't have been time to break them in. You couldn't expect him to admit that he had taken his father's advice. Saturday lunch at the O'Connor's is no longer a meal when the whole family sits down together. Barry has to get his early to dash off for the tryouts for the ski team. Tim is off to the movies with David. Joan, who just got home, is eating a quick snack before going to watch the ski trials with her own crowd. This is more Joan's kind of date, a transition from the gang to the single emotional attachment. themselves, independent, still striving, enjoying, daring, competing, and even if they lose, they gain in their advance toward maturity. Saturday evening, the usual few ex teenagers are watching TV at the O'Connors. The guests, of course, are the ones who think of making room for mother and father. There is comfort in the thought that Barry would be polite at someone else's house. Another day has passed, a day of ups and downs as are most days in a teenager's life, a day and learning as they live. They are finding themselves. To do this, they need freedom to be themselves. And yet, they still need guidance to help them become the kind of people they want to be. They need to think for themselves, and yet they need to understand and sense the feelings of others. They are children no longer, and yet they are not quite adults. But they combine some of the warmest, gayest, and deepest elements of both. To be fully appreciated, they must be understood. <laughs> 